Masters in Public Policy at OP Jindal University, presently interning with the Energy and Resources Institute. We welcome you to the interactive session on Generation Green, promoting sustainable lifestyles for youth, by youth, with His Excellency, Mr. Virginia Sinkavichus. Mr. Sinkavichus is the present European Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries. Prior to this, he held the position of Minister of Economy from 2017 to 2019, and before that, he led the Committee of Economy at the Parliament of Lithuania. He has also been elected to the Parliament in October 2016, and prior to that, he was a team lead for regulatory affairs at Invest Lithuania. This event is organized by Terry in collaboration with the European Union, European Union Resource Efficiency Initiative, EURI, GIZ, and Center for Responsible Business. On the dais, we have the presence of esteemed dignitaries, His Excellency Commissioner Sinkavichus, His Excellency Mr. Seppo Nurmi, Charge d'Affaires, EU Delegation India, and Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri, distinguished fellow Terry. The event focuses on the need for acknowledging roles, responsibilities, and rights of India's youth in bringing about intergenerational equity, considering half of India's population is less than 30 years old. To ensure the session flows efficiently and smoothly, I would like to reiterate the session's agenda entails three segments. Segment one is announcements and launches involving three releases. First, the 10-point action agenda for life and youth. Second, the impact report, agents of change, youth empowerment on circular economy and resource efficiency. And third, the campaigns for mission life. Next segment is the keynote address by His Excellency, Mr. Virginia Sinkavich. And lastly, the special youth session segment involving Q&A between His Excellency and the youth. Moving on, it's my pleasure to invite Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri, sir, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, let me say that I am personally very delighted and happy to welcome you here. And let me say that, I say that, of course, because you are here with Terry, an institution that I've been associated with for more than 15, 16 years, and perhaps, and please allow me to say that, perhaps India's foremost institution dealing with the environment, climate change, and sustainability. And we began doing all this well before most people realized that this was the issue of the future. Your Excellency, one of our former directors was the chair of the IPCC at the time when the IPCC was recognized by the world and awarded the Nobel Prize. This is that kind of institution. So we are very happy to welcome you here. Let me let you know that about a year and a half back, we had the honor and privilege of welcoming Mr. Franz Timmermans, who sat in exactly this very chair. And we had a session here before the then COP, which was taking place. So we are very honored to have you here. Of course, on my part, I'm very happy having been India's ambassador to the European Union. And I believe, therefore, I have a unique privilege of understanding what perhaps is not just the greatest peace project for the world, but perhaps something which is an institutional arrangement put together by humankind in 27 countries today, basically for the betterment of the humankind and the way we take things forward. Your Excellency, allow me just to say a few words to these young people who are assembled here. And I want to tell you, they come from some of the finest institutions in Delhi, which are dealing with issues of sustainability, climate, and the environment. They are involved in issues which are technologically involved, policy issues, as well as on the legal side. These, Your Excellency, believe me, like you, sir, I see that as somebody who doesn't have white hair and beard and so on and so forth. The, these people, along with all of you, are those who are going to mold the future. And I'm very delighted to see them here in relatively large number. Your Excellency, for them, I want to tell you, having the European Commissioner and the European Union in front of us is, let me assure you, a unique opportunity for all of you. It is not just that it's a rich place. It's not just that it's a place which is a big financial and technological hub. The main reason why I would stress this, it's the place which sets the standards for the world. It's the place from where ideas emanate. 
and it's the place which I dare say much of the world, including us, find useful to follow on because these are good ideas, ideas which are really ideas which are important for human good. Today, we will certainly all of you ask His Excellency about the Green Deal. Your Excellency, without any doubt, lots of us, everybody spoke at Glasgow, somebody else spoke later on at Sharm El Sheikh, but you actually went ahead and did it. You've enshrined it in law. You've done the same in the area of biodiversity. We're doing things in skilling. Somebody here told me, I want to speak about right to repair. I come from a developing country, sir. Most of us are fixing things all the time in any case. But it's nice to know how you can do these things in the context of the developing world and the evolving thinking about all of us of taking things forward. Your Excellency, I don't want to stand here and speak too much. I want all of them to hear you. I want them to interact with you. And I want to tell you that the young minds in India are extremely energized, extremely interested, and sustainability is something which I believe most of them have internalized as something extremely important for them. I want to once again, on behalf of my entire set of colleagues in Terry, welcome you wholeheartedly. And I want to thank the EU delegation for their friendship, cooperation, and always being there with us, and in fact, having been mentors for us in various ways. Really, thank you to you, Mr. Sharjah, and to all your colleagues here. Your Excellency, welcome to Terry, and we hope that you have an evening here today, even though you don't have too much time, one that is actually fruitful to you in terms of what you take back from the youth of India and the ideas which sit in their minds. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Puri, for your illuminating insights into the way forward for India's youth in integrating a sustainable lifestyle. Moving on to the next segment, I would like to invite my colleague, Ms. Madhuparna Mehti, to release the 10-point action agenda for life and youth. Thanks for the introduction, Ishita. Good evening, all. I'm Madhuparna Mehti, Project Associate at the Energy and Resources Institute. And it gives me immense pleasure to announce the 10-point agenda, action agenda, on the behalf of the Terry team. In our 10-point action agenda for lifestyle, for environment, for life, and youth, we believe in the power of mobilizing individuals to drive exponential change. We commit to act for Earth by empowering youth through capacity building, sustaining behavioral changes, and integrating sustainability in all fields. We strive to share knowledge and convene intergenerational dialogues on circular economy, sustainable lifestyle, biodiversity-sensitive policies, advocate for nature-based solutions, and promote a shift from anthropocentric to nature-centric policies for intergenerational and intergenerational equity. We continue to design sustainable development solutions and integrate them as well as mainstream them through policy innovations such as green budgeting. Together, we address global governance gaps and amplify global South perspectives in shaping norms on critical focus areas such as the global commons, global goal on adaptation, financing loss and damage, climate finance, global stock take, and transparency. Let us unite to create a thriving, resilient planet for all. Join us on this transformative journey. May I request the esteemed dignitaries to come forward to launch the 10 point agenda. Excellency, what do we do? Hold it. Yeah. You come and join us here, right here, with His Excellency. I love Please stand there. Uh, can I get an action point as well? Please come. Oh, here, here. Thank you so much. Sir, you are very important. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madhuparna. Next, I invite Ms. Reva and Mr. Ashish from EU REI and Indian Youth Climate Network, IYCN, respectively, to release impact report Agents of Change Youth Empowerment on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency. Thank you, Ishita. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, esteemed dignitaries, uh, His Excellency, 
Uh, we are very happy to uh, uh, showcase the impact report uh, for the work that we have done with the Indian Youth Climate Network with an aim to both empower youth as well as engage with youth on issues of circular economy and uh, and the solutions that uh, will present to us uh, in future. I will now invite uh, Ashish to kindly share what the work has been and uh, so. uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Reva. Uh, so Indian Youth Climate Network with support from EORI uh, has we started this journey a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, and uh, we started off by conducting a survey to understand the areas of knowledge uh, improvement, youth aspirations and needs, uh, you know, and building upon this understanding, IYCN with the URAI conducted technical capacity building workshops uh, on circular economy as well as awareness workshops across the country. We invited youth from rural districts, uh, youth innovators, uh, students and uh, prof working professionals and uh, students from very diverse backgrounds. In this entire journey, we identified youth led many youth led solutions, innovators working who were working on circular economy and resource efficiency and documented those impact stories in the form of a podcast. We also uh, advertised those stories on radio to give them a pan India outreach. Uh, and not just that, we also use this opportunity to organize small youth consultations to understand youth demands and needs, uh, what they want exactly and uh, where uh, are the uh, hurdles. Uh, and finally, all this information led to the launch of three key initiatives, uh, Indian Youth Circular Economy Forum, the Circular Campus Initiative and Youth Circular Economy Pledge. Uh, which were the key outcomes of uh, this intervention. And through these uh, initiatives, we and you aim to amplify the impact of agents of change uh, going forward. Thank you so much. Great. Great. I mean, I request all the dignitaries and so, the excellency to kindly uh, release the impact come. report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reva and Ashish. Now I invite Ms. Neha Tomar from Center for Responsible Business to release campaigns for Mission Life. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Firstly, um, thank you to His Excellency and all the dignitaries. And uh, thank you, EU, for supporting us with this report. Um, so basically, this report, an assortment of relevant campaigns for effective implementation and localization of mission life is a very simple report, but uh, it took us a lot of hard work. What we're trying, what we're trying to do here is we gathered 12 campaigns, eight from the EU and four from non-EU countries. And we try to look at how these campaigns match the, um, the, the intention, the goal, the ambition of mission life. And we looked at some key recommendations that could be culled out from these campaigns and um, which go into the architectural features of some effective and mass and um, outcome oriented campaigns. So uh, I'd like to invite the dignitaries and His Excellency and my colleague Sia to please uh, come forth and launch the report. Excellency, Terry does a lot, which is why the third time we have you all. Young lady, please come. Thank you, Neha and Sia. We will now proceed to the next segment where our esteemed guest, His Excellency, Mr. Virginia Sinkavichis, will deliver the keynote address. I request Ambassador Puri to chair the session. Sir, please. Thank you. Unless you want to sit here. Oh, I will say yes. Welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, of course, it's uh, my big pleasure, distinguished ambassador, uh, your Terry team, uh, GIZ and, and, and CRB partners. And really, let me first of all, thank you for convening uh, us here in this uh, outstanding uh, uh, building and to have this direct exchange. So I won't be long in, 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 in my speech because I think the most interesting part is always Q&A. 
or you can ask direct questions and then I, I can answer them. But first of all, I have to say a big thank you because I've traveled quite a lot of world and uh, many struggled with my name and I never expected that in India it will be pronounced perfectly. Really, thank you very much. And of course, thank you to, to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's, it's an excellent evening and a great opportunity. I always enjoy those opportunities uh, to have these direct exchanges with, with youth in Europe, in other parts of the world, because I know that after you know this evening, I'll be leaving even more inspired, inspired to continue what, what we are doing. And since the beginning of uh, this commission in 2019, the first um, initiative, the flagship initiative of this commission, which was launched, was the European Green Deal. And to be very honest, the background of the Green Deal, after we suffered COVID and, and uh, uh, devastating uh, war in Ukraine, we might forgot, but there were actually youth protests around the world. And they were the key push uh, for uh, the new, for newly formed government, uh, newly formed commission to actually put a flagship initiative of the European Green Deal, which includes many pillars. Of course, the key one is uh, uh, the climate policies and uh, our goal of uh, decarbonizing Europe's economy by 2030, 55%. And then uh, by 2050, uh, reach a complete zero. But what's very important that we not only have it as aspiration, as a goal, as a promise to future generations, you can sugarcoat it in many ways. We have it as the legislation. And I think that's the most important. We have it as a law. And not only law, but now with our Fit for 55 package, we have a concrete steps in each and every, uh, basically, area where we need to achieve that change from transport, agriculture, uh, energy, of course, and, and so on. I think this is important uh, because Europe always strives to uh, lead by example. And I think, you know, the only way forward is to really show that it can work, that we can have economic growth, we can create a successful society, and decrease our emissions. Because very much it's still in this old economy understanding that uh, emissions and economic growth is somehow married. And it's absolutely not true. And I think European example is a great proof uh, of that. Of course, European Green Deal cannot be seen as an initiative coming from climate portfolio or environmental portfolio. It's a horizontal one. It's a horizontal change. And that's probably the biggest challenge of it, where you need to find a landing zone for everyone, for different regions, for different parts. Uh, in European Union, we have 27 member states with different histories, with different culture, with different development, and you need to bring them all together and move forward towards, uh, towards implementation of the legislation. Therefore, of course, we see a crucial part and, and crucial pillars of the European Green Deal, our biodiversity strategy, especially now being reinforced with the, with the global uh, biodiversity framework, because we should not forget that uh, climate change and biodiversity loss is reinforcing crisis, reinforcing each other. And IPCC uh, reports, which gives us hope if we act, they are calculated that ecosystems are able to cope. So it means that we also able to stop biodiversity loss. We cannot continue to have uh, uh, ecosystems degrading. If our oceans, if our forests, if our soils, they are not able to absorb carbon, even if we do an excellent job decarbonizing our economies, we are still bust. And that's extremely important to always bear in mind uh, the full picture. Another key pillar of the European Green Deal is zero pollution policy. Because pollution is also reinforcing uh, uh, climate change and especially uh, biodiversity loss. So our zero pollution is first of all aimed at uh, water policies, because clean water and clean air cannot be a luxury. It should be something that everyone has access uh, to it. And most importantly, it has such a tremendous impact on the well-being and, and health of our society. 
and very often, uh, you know, I don't have an issue to convince ministers responsible for environment about the cause and need uh, to, to implement certain changes. But I struggle to implement my former colleagues, ministers of economy or ministers of finance. And very often, pollution is something that's forgotten, that's not in the budget lines. But trust me, it's there through these working days that people were not able to come through the early deaths that people suffer from uh, from respiratory diseases. Um, so socioeconomic pressures of pollution, they are huge, but very much, very often they are uh, somewhere disappears between the budget lines and uh, the healthcare system, and we should not forget. And the fourth key pillar is circular economy, which I see that uh, your reports focused a lot. Because as I said, the key task is not only to decrease emissions, but really show that we can create a wealthy society, we can create a well-being uh, with decreasing emissions, with decreasing the pressures on, 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 on biodiversity, while also creating jobs and opportunities. And circular economy is exactly about that, ensuring that we use as long as possible resources that we already extracted, we reuse them, recycle, repurpose, repair uh, when possible, so it means avoiding uh, emissions while extracting resources, avoiding emissions while producing additionally, and, uh, and so on. While also, as I said, you know, taking off the pressures from, uh, the, uh, uh, from the ecosystems, because extraction of resources is one of the biggest pressures on uh, the ecosystems. These are the key pillars, which we, of course, each of them are now, after four years in the mandate, are topped up with the legislation. Uh, but one important part is also horizontal across uh, uh, all these policies, is the global uh, effort. Because, you know, EU on its own, with 27 member states, can do as much as it can. But if those uh, losses of biodiversity will continue in those mega diverse countries, one of them we are uh, currently are at. Uh, if we continue to lose Amazon forests, if emissions will uh, leave European economy, but will find a place in some other parts of the world, we all bust. So that's the biggest probably difference that what we are facing while we talk about the climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, these are transboundary issues and these are global issues. And that's why we are all in the same boat and we have to row uh, basically the same direction in same rhythm. So that challenge is even, even greater because I told you about the challenge of 27 um, member states. How about, you know, more than 193 countries uh, uh, trying to achieve uh, something together. I still think we have uh, done a tremendous job. Uh, the Paris Agreement is a, a, a big milestone. Uh, COP15 in Montreal, uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, the recent agreement um, uh, finished negotiations after 20 years on the protection of the, the high seas shows that international momentum is there. However, we also are very good at celebrating the moments when we agree and achieve something, but we have to wake up the next day and go to work again, and it's the hardest part, it's implementation. And this is where we still need to do a lot, and I would say should have done much more. Uh, but, you know, I always believe in a bright future, uh, and I hope that we can still catch up and do even more with the technological progress, with the inspiration of, 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 of people like you, and political willingness to act and be responsible and not betray uh, short-term economic gains for uh, the future uh, generations. So your role is crucial, and programs uh, like uh, the one you have here uh, in Mission Life is a particularly important, where you have ambassadors, people on the ground talking about the change, understanding the change, because IPCC reports, they are great, but you know, the whole of society is, of course, not able to read it and understand it fully. 
So therefore, it's extremely important uh, that you talk about it, that you do understand uh, the change, and you help shape uh, the policy on the ground. And this is what I see in many of your reports exactly talking about the change on the ground, how it's going to affect our daily life, how it's going to affect socio-economic well-being, how it's going to affect different regions, how it's going to affect farmer or forester. Is there a farmer or forester or a fisherman without a fish, without a tree, or without a fertile soil? I'll stop here, because I know you have many more questions, but it's my pleasure uh, to be here. It's my pleasure to talk with you, and I'll do my best uh, to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency, for such an enlightening and informative address. I'm sure the youth listening to you today will benefit from it. I would re now request Ambassador Puri to kindly hand over the invitation for WSDS 2024 to His Excellency, along with the actual birth badge and token of appreciation from Terry. Your Excellency, Terry hosts perhaps the largest event in the developing world dealing with environment, sustainability, and climate change. We call it the World Sustainable Development Summit. The next one will be in February, and we really hope that you would be able to join us in person. So I'm privileged to hand over an invitation. It's a good way to invite and, <laughs> and put additional pressure. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Delighted. I also want to tell you that we are opening an embassy in Vilnius. Yes, and the ambassador is on his way. I know, I know. So I'm very Thank delighted. Thank you. So we should give you this badge. So you've already got one, but we're going to put another one there. There you are. Now we have a good. Mr. Shashay, may I give you this? Oh, uh, yeah, I will. Keep and that. to the others there. Please get. There. So the token Thank of this and so, so that you that there Thank you. Right. So please okay. Oh. Thank you. This is this to remind you of Terry. And so let me tell you, it's 50 years of this organization. So this is an organization in the South, in India, which recognized that this was an issue that the world had to face with for its own good. We're very proud of that. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Charger, Thank you. You're must, awesome. You are part of us. You have to delight to be welcome. Moving on to the interactive session, which will be moderated by Dr. Lavleen Kalon, Senior Fellow and Associate Director, Terry. Thank you. Um, as we look forward to create more beautiful memories from today's evening, uh, it gives me immense pleasure to open the floor for questions for the day. And uh, as we move on, I would also like to mention that we are just 16 days away from the International Youth Day celebrations. And the theme for this year, the International Youth Day is on 16th August, is Green Skills for Youth Towards a Sustainable World. And here we are anchoring the program for the youth, by the youth. And with this, we move on to our first question for the day. We did do some exercise before today's event because we wanted to pull in the views of many, many youth who are joined with Terry in our journey. Terry has a very strong youth program. Annually, we reach out to close to 25,000 schools and 10,000 colleges across different projects. And this is a representation of the strength of the youth and the questions we bring to you. Uh, without um, more uh, adding from my side, uh, may I request Vibhusha? Vibhusha, you had expressed a desire to ask His Excellency a question. The floor is yours. You can uh, speak from there. Um, hello, I'm Vibhusha. I'm Secretary of the Indian Youth Planet Network, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Ashish, who is the Secretary of the Indian Youth Planet Network, and Pradeshka, who is one of our board members. Uh, we'd like to ask you today, how does the right to repair in EU tie in with the aspects of jobs, skills, and opportunities for you? 
And where do you see potential areas for collab collaboration between the Indian and European groups in this respect? Mm. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for your, your excellent uh, question, starting with the uh, with right to repair, which uh, is actually initiative that has been also uh, very much awaited uh, by the Europeans, because I think, you know, many noticed that we somehow at some point were able to repair everything and now we either forgot or we face uh, the challenge that the device we buy, we just cannot even open it. <laughs> and the only thing we can do is actually throw it away and buy the new one. In very particular cases, we can, we can, we can repair it. So of course, we wanted to overcome that because as I said, the key principle of the circular economy is ensuring that we keep resources as long as possible. So why, if your battery is slow or your screen is broken or some other parts of your refrigerator or washing machine is not working, why it cannot be repaired? Why it comes to bizarre situation where uh, repair costs uh, more than actually buying sometimes a new one. So this is a uh, initiative which first of all, going to uh, bring in uh, new skills and I would say skills that are not uh, uh, a rocket science, but skills that can be very easily, uh, you know, learned. And, you know, those pop-up shops can be open in different parts of, of, of the world, especially when we talk about Europe, different parts of Europe. So you don't need basically to be the center, the city, to uh, have those, uh, to learn those uh, basic skills of repairing, let's say one segment. It can be electronics, it can be garments, uh, it can be something else. But what we really want to do is of course, ensuring that there is an opportunity to repair. So what we change with our eco uh, design directive now, uh, we are still in the process of, of finalizing the legislation with the European Parliament and Council, where the producers they will have to ensure that the parts are available. Uh, in the digital product passport, uh, they will have to name you know, the parts that are going to be broken first, and if they are repairable, how long they're supposed to last, because all these things, uh, all these things are pre-designed. And it's very strange when, you know, with this great technological progress, uh, washing machine from serving 15 years has been able to serve only seven. So, you know, there was a progress everywhere except in, in some areas. So, you know, all such things, they are designed. That's why we are tackling the design stage, ensuring that repairability is enshrined in uh, design stage. Then, of course, we will uh, uh, need a, a, a right set of skills. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that it will also have another effect. It will have an opportunity to move because now, for example, if you are a large producer of laptops, most likely you're producing your laptop in uh, China. And on the ground, you have only, you know, sales in, uh, uh, in, in the stores. I think it brings actually an opportunity to have local jobs and offer laptop as a service so that you don't own the laptop, but basically you take it as a service, you use it for some time, you return it back at the local office where it's refurbished and then it landed as a service uh, again. So business as a service model, I think with this is going to prevail much more, but also will open uh, the opportunities uh, for, for, for repairing. Now, uh, the uh, opportunities for uh, collaboration, I think, you know, India is very vibrant market, which has enormous potential in Toronto. And inevitably, India's consumption pattern is going to grow. So, you know, I think what's extremely important is to ensure that that consumption pattern is not, uh, you know, making mistakes that some of us did uh, in the past. That that consumption pattern is not depriving, uh, you know, uh, India's ecosystem's uh, future. So I think this is a, a very much something that can be uh, uh, shared 
we are very happy to to uh, cooperate in, in in circular economy. Share what we have achieved. Share uh, our uh, legislation, which you know I never believe in copy paste, but definitely can be adjusted and adopted. And I think with especially you know growing large population having you know uh, uh, a repairability as an opportunity, business as a service uh, 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 opportunity creates you know a completely new uh, uh, opportunities and creates a basically a whole different economy. But most importantly, you know what I really like about the circular economy, that it's while doing so, and everyone always focuses on the numbers, on you know, uh, on, 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 on budgets, on percentages, but it really takes off enormous pressure uh, from the ecosystem. It decreases enormous amounts of the uh, emissions saves enormous uh, amounts uh, of the emissions. We cannot afford this old linear economic model where we basically make use and then uh, throw away. This is the culture which we should make a past. And I truly count on, on young people having a completely different uh, responsibility. Buying more is not really a proof of, 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 of luxury. I think on contrary, it's a irresponsible behavior. Thank you so much. Can, can I say something? This is really fantastic what you said. You know, we come from a country, Excellency, you can just step out of the India Habitat Center and you can see repair. But that's not what you said. You said something very important. That in the manufacture, you build in the ability to repair and make that a right and the legal frameworks for that. And I think that's something
land converted into into the uh, agriculture land. Those products cannot be sold uh, on our domestic market too, even so it's a domestic uh, uh, producer. I think this gives us credibility to talk about you know halting deforestation, and I hope that you know we will be followed uh, by uh, other countries, by other developed countries. Uh, because you know you cannot be at the same time a market for the goods coming from deforested land and uh, talk against deforestation and put some you know uh, millions into you know uh, funds uh, fighting deforestation. It's just not credible. Uh, and I fully agree that on the other hand, you know you cannot deprive uh, the future and uh, the opportunities of well-being of, of, of indigenous people. Of, of locals who live there, but I'm sure that they can be part of the solution. If you look at the situation on the ground, and I visited most of those uh, mega uh, uh, diverse places around the world, meeting indigenous people, they actually the first ones to suffer because they are deprived of their uh, indigenous lands, uh, and uh, you know it goes to horrific things as the loss of, of lives. And in some of those parts, you know, being a, a nature protectionist is one of the most uh, dangerous things that, that you can do. And I think this is not a, a part of the story. Another uh, iconic legislation which we've put forward is nature restoration legislation, uh, which after 30 years is the second uh, basically EU legislation. After 30 years, it's first EU legislation on environment, which actually puts legally binding targets on nature restoration. For example, you know, restoring 20% of uh, EU uh, land and 20% of uh, EU uh, marine areas with concrete uh, targets on pollinators, farmland birds, uh, uses, uh, uses of, uh, of, of pesticides, in, uh, restoring the free flow of, of rivers and uh, etc. Of course, there was lots of lots of debates, but we we are moving forward, and I hope that we will be able this year to finalize uh, this legislation to show that we also deliver uh, domestically, and it's going to be um, an extremely important part as regards the global biodiversity uh, framework implementation. I truly hope uh, that we will be able uh, at COP16 have at least the assessment of the implementation gap. I hope that by that time we will be able to agree on monitoring mechanisms because you know targets without a solid monitoring mechanism without the uh, milestones uh, you know interim targets very concrete ones they are just empty promises as I told you about the the, the climate law that we have uh, adopted you know you can sugarcoat it in many ways uh, but it has to be a legislation. It has to have funding behind it. Uh, it has to be a law which then uh, uh, being implemented. So I truly hope that we will be able to achieve as much as possible with the global uh, biodiversity framework. Uh, I see low hanging fruit, for example, uh, harmful subsidies, which you know we talk so much and we put so much effort and and it really requires uh, a lot of uh, a lot of time, energy, and resources. To convince you know uh, uh, ministers to put you know uh, additional funding uh, for uh, climate for biodiversity projects, but then you know at the same time while putting one dollar on implementation, we make four or five steps back by you know funding uh, the activities that are harmful. And I think that's again illogical. So we truly need to find harmful uh, find harmful subsidies and then you know steer those uh, uh, funds into implementation. Because again, when you look at the uh, uh, global biodiversity framework, we do realize that this implementation is not going to be equal. Uh, some parts, uh, they, you know, manage to save their own growth forests. They are extremely rich and lucky countries to have such a unique ecosystem. And we cannot deprive them from uh, their economic and social growth. So we, of course, need to find the mechanism that they would be fairly rewarded. And uh, the benefits that are uh, being received from uh, the marine uh, ecosystems or even from those indigenous uh, uh, forests, from those mega, most mega diverse forests, it would be also equally shared. 
it would fit in into 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 the biodiversity fund that would allow us uh, implementation. Thank you, uh, His Excellency. Uh, you know, like another message we're going to take from what you have said now is solutions start when we acknowledge that the problem exists. So thank you so much for that key message we have from you. And yes, you have rightly asserted and affirmed that regions of biodiversity richness coincide with linguistic and uh, indigenous people presence. So uh, when we acknowledge the presence of a person, that will make us look for solutions. So thank you so much for these important messages for us to remember. And I see Prane here, who has been uh, with Terry for a pretty long period. Now, Prane, it's your turn to put forward your views. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And let me put the question and everyone is present here. My name is Prane, and I'm currently majoring in biological sciences at Delhi University, as well as returning at Terry. So, my question for you would be that on, 20, on 2nd March 2022, the heads of state, ministers of environment, and other representatives from 175 nations. They endorsed a historic resolution at the UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi. And that was to end plastic pollution as well as sign a legally binding agreement uh, to buy 2024. So, how do you think that target is achievable? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very, very good question yeah. on uh, extremely important agreement. So, it's good that youth is keeping an eye, and I hope we'll be keeping a pressure. So that we really finalize the agreement by by 2024. You know, EU's position was from from uh, the very beginning, and and when I talked to to you in my introductory remarks about the zero pollution uh, targets, you know, we've done a great work in recycling uh, in some parts of of the world better than in the other. So, but recycling overall increased. However, if you look. Plastic pollution has increased even more. So we should not be naive that we can recycle our way out of it. Therefore, we first of all, of course, we need a level playing field. So we need a globally binding agreement, and that's extremely important. In that globally binding agreement, first of all, we of course have to respect uh, hierarchy of the waste. So how you deal with the waste that you know repurposing and recycling is the first thing that you basically do, then we will be able to create a secondary raw materials market, which again can take out enormously the preface from uh, the ecosystems because you know it's very difficult to convince businesses to use uh, uh, secondary raw materials when it's more expensive than actually using primary materials. So we, if we have this agreement, I think we have a very good chance of creating secondary raw materials market. In, in the plastic, I'm talking. Secondly, I think we need to get use, uh, get to basically ban uh, useless, uh, uh, you know, uh, single use plastics that can be, that already, you know, uh, some of the, uh, the replacements exist, that they are not more expensive, that they are available at the market. Because it's ridiculous that sometimes, you know, you have a product that takes, you know, basically, one second to make, maybe up to one minute to use, and then it stays 100 uh, years with us in, uh, in the environment, because it just cannot be even recycled, and then it gets into microplastics and etc. cetera, and, 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 and so on. So I think this is uh, extremely important. Secondly, I think extremely important that in that agreement we will have a very clear language on uh, the secondary raw material being used in production. Of, uh, uh, of a new product. So, for example, you know, uh, uh, secondary uh, plastic, certain percent, maybe at the beginning we will start with the lower uh, uh, mark, being used in production of, let's say, plastic bottles or, 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 or some other production, then basically, you know, there would be also a need. And then we can, uh, after a few years, increase uh, that mark where there is a bigger and bigger uh, availability. So I think, you know, it must start with basically going into the source of the pollution, banning what is absolutely unnecessary as much as we are able to agree on that, 
then basically enshrining recyclability in what is going to be to be released. Uh, I think this then gives us a truly, truly uh, a hope. Now, I would say that uh, the progress has been uh, actually uh, been been uh, been quite good. Um, you have actually very, I think, uh, good work between developing and developed countries on this because you know plastic pollution is 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 being a pressure that's that's being shared. Island nations, they are the first ones to really wanting to fight it because you know uh, plastic pollution in the ocean is something that they are facing. It's something that kills uh, uh, the ecosystems uh, around them. It's something that kills the well-being, uh, deprives the local communities of, uh, of the fisheries, uh, deprives them of the, the uh, tourism, and, and so on. So it's. I think it's been uh, been uh, fairly good progress. The last I see in Paris managed to achieve uh, that you know the chair will prepare a zero draft. So we will finally have a first basically paper on which uh, we can work. Uh, and I hope that you know those countries that are heavily dependent on uh, income from petrochemicals, they will also find their way into this agreement because they've been the most difficult so far. Uh, uh, but uh, I think, you know, again, uh, this is something where the majority is, is really keen on, on adopting and I hope that we will be able to do it and most importantly, it's important to do on time by 2024 because as I said, you know, the issues that we are facing every day, they aggravating and becoming bigger and bigger. Thank you. That was really profound. And uh, if we just think about it, uh, His Excellency, sir, what you're offering us is now a roadmap towards green skills for youth. So the areas which have been now identified and mapped for changes are actually areas that can be for emerging technologies that the youth can pursue. So thank you so much for those uh, wise words. And now, uh, may I invite Mohammed Sayed Ali? Would you like to put your question, please? And my question is that, or as we all know, that the European Deal itself gives much emphasis and has created efforts on. Okay. The series works on uh, okay. planet roofing and green building and what was it? Green building and prevention and uh, prevention and preparedness. In order to uh, like like in like in uh, in order to like emulate the European like EU's uh, remarkable achievements. In order to like emulate EU's market achievement, what steps do you think we can take with, with our aspirations to be like uh, climate climate uh, climate neutral region ourselves? Just give me one second. I don't know if I said the question I forgot about it. In order to emulate EU's market achievement and aspire to become a climate neutral region ourselves, what specific steps do you think we can take like with uh, to like or learn and adopt from the EU's EU's approach? As it, as it has been for the past few years. The so what, uh, Ali, you actually want to uh, reconfirm and check here is like how the European Green Deal, how it's set forward in a perfect example, how can uh, the other regions of the world aspire and take from the best practices and set up a parallel example? So more or less um, uh, path that you feel that the youth should be following now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Please. Okay. I can keep the question if you want me to. You no, no, no. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, no, so I think you know we have discussed a lot already on the Green Deal agenda today, and I would be uh, repeating myself. Uh, of course, as I said, you know I don't believe in copy pasting, but then on the other hand, when we face uh, uh, global challenges uh, such as uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution. And especially when we inked our ambition in uh, Paris Agreement, in global uh, biodiversity framework in, in, in Montreal, 
there is also not so much uh, scope for improvisation. You know, you cannot uh, decrease uh, pollution uh, by not fighting it at the source. So basically having a regulation which would promote uh, mobility, uh, energy, uh, that would be, you know, zero emissions, but also uh, clean as regards the, the pollution. You cannot, you know, find a way around uh, fighting pollution uh, without, you know, addressing uh, pollution at the source, so for example, at the industry level, uh, with, of course, taking into account um, the, the newest uh, innovation uh, technologies that can be uh, installed. Same goes with the with the fighting emissions. So you know, uh, in Europe, the most effective way is, of course, carbon pricing, which already proved to be a very effective effective way. The last main thing which I wanted uh, would like to just add on top of what was already uh, mentioned many times uh, in, 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 in different uh, legislation, biodiversity, zero pollution, uh, climate, uh, but one thing which was maybe not, not mentioned, but still I think is, is very important, uh, is um, producer responsibility. This is something when we talk about the plastic pollution or when we talk overall about, you know, uh, polluting, uh, polluting uh, businesses, you know, they cannot just dump production on the market. It doesn't matter, you are a producer or you're just an important importer. Uh, you also have to take responsibility for collecting it and ensuring that it's being dealt within the uh, hierarchy of the waste, which I already named with uh, repurposing, uh, uh, remanufacturing, repairing, recycling, whichever way uh, suits you best, uh, best. So I think this is a very good financial incentive uh, for businesses to take responsibility for uh, their production and ensuring that it's not just, you know, basically to put as much as possible on the market, but really have a, a much more uh, responsible approach. But on top of that, you know, I've named already uh, many uh, initiatives of, uh, of ours, such as Right to Repair, such as Eco Design Directive, basically addressing the, the design. Uh, you know, waste management, which is also key and extremely important, zero uh, pollution uh, ambition, and most importantly, you know, when we talk about uh, certain goals, whether it's to protect 30% of, of land and, and, and maritime areas, or decrease emissions by 55%, it cannot be just a goals that we kind of all discussed, agreed, and left uh, the room happy about. No, it has to be a legislation followed with concrete steps, concrete plans, and concrete funding. Then it will be implemented. I always said that, you know, when someone tells me that these things are priorities, I always say, show me the budget line, and I will tell you if it's your real priorities. Perfectly right. Thank you so much. Polluter pays. That's the key message that we all need to with us. Uh, I would say that the S17 partnerships and networks is what the youth should be moving towards. There is a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of uh, experience sharing up for you. So just jump up and grab the opportunity and make the world a better place to live in. Uh, with this, uh, maybe the last question for today, Nikita, would you like to take the floor, please? Good evening, everyone. Well, my question regarding biodiversity degradation and nature restoration that you were talking about. So as you've seen that afforestation drives are conducted to balance the emission rates that are happening. And most of the time we tend to focus on mono uh, culture. And instead, I think we should look for an alternative about multi-species plantation. So how do you think youth can facilitate doing that? Also, can I ask one more question? Yes. Yes. So the second one, when you said about efficiency and environment being a trade-off and an opportunity cost. Also, I think EU and India are similar to ways because there's so much diversity in EU and same like we have so many states and so many different regions. How do you think we can manage environment and efficiency rather than being an opportunity cost to each other? What do you say? 
So let me start with, with the second. I think it just you you have to start with uh, uh, making sure it's your uh, priority, truly your priority. And then when you put it as a priority, then you will find the ways how to ensure that your priority is uh, is well uh, served. How you balance it out. How you pick on economic activities that do no uh, do no harm. I think that it is all possible. You have you know even in this room. Uh, great knowledge, uh, great skills uh, that can definitely equip the decision makers with. Um, always, of course, it's uh, difficult to change. Everyone is uh, used to status quo and that we don't want to change. Uh, but uh, this change is inevitable. And this is where, you know, probably the first part of, of your question. What we now have also in, in, in Europe is, is, is a very devastating situation in some parts, you know. Uh, Parts of Greece, uh, around Athens, uh, Attica, uh, is 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 burning. Uh, most precious islands, which are loved by tourists from all around the world, such as Rhodes, uh, Rhodes and, and or Sicily, they are uh, also burning. And and you know, it already takes uh, not only you know heavy toll on on nature, but also human lives. And if you look at, at actually those maps, uh, what are the biggest risk of uh, forest fires? Because you know now when you have temperatures over 40 degrees in Europe, it's you know you have to have very resilient forests so that the forest fires wouldn't start. It's it's you know the the conditions are 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 are, are very uh, fortunate for for forests that to 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 begin. But exactly monocultures. Uh, this is one of the, the issues which, you know, burns the, the, the forest. You know, the more diverse forest you have, the better uh, managed forest you have, the less of the risk of, of, of those fires is actually to, to start, or there is a bigger chance of actually contain them and, and, uh, and ensure that they can be, uh, you know, relatively quickly, uh, uh, quickly uh, put down. So this is a, a, a extremely important part, because when it comes to the ecosystems, and if ecosystems are not able to provide, then you're going to face a very difficult reality and difficult consequences. And by ecosystem, you know, when we talk about forest, you can plant 15,000 trees, but it's not a forest. To become a forest, it takes time. And, you know, the trees are precious, but the soil under the trees uh, the sponge effect, basically, that it can create. This is the ecosystem. When the ecosystem is created, as I said, you know, these are much more resilient to diseases. Uh, it's much more resilient uh, to, 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 to forest fires. And I think this is something we've been missing. You know, I, I hear many politicians and overall people, you know, everyone loves planting trees. It's great, absolutely, and I absolutely love it when finally uh, some of the mayors in, 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 in cities in Europe, first they cut the trees, now they replant the trees. Uh, because they realize that the temperatures are too hot, we need shadow, and, and trees were doing a great work. Okay, at least they learn from mistakes. But what's extremely, extremely important is, is actually uh, to focus not at the tree planting itself, but the right tree at the right place uh, to be planted, ensuring the resilience. And especially when we talk about, you know, planting a large numbers of trees, basically, you know, programming uh, forest, because it will take some years uh, and some generations uh, for that forest to fully to grow, you have to uh, program a resilient forest, which would be resilient to the climate change that inevitably putting bigger and bigger uh, pressure, and will have a bigger and bigger toll on our ecosystems. Thank you so much. You. So diversity is indeed beautiful. And uh, I think like us, even the plants and trees, they really want to be diverse. All of us wanted to get out of our school uniforms because we wanted to have a flair of different type of diversity all around us. So thank you so much for that beautiful response. And yes, resilience will pay 
And uh, there are other questions, but for paucity of time, I think we will conclude here. Conclude here, and may I hand over back to you, Ashita? Thank you so much, Mr. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, ma'am. It was truly a knowledge enriching segment. Now I request Dr. Shelley Kadia, Senior Fellow and Associate Director Terry, to give the vote of thanks. Thanks, Ashita. Your Excellency Commissioner Sinkiewiczs, uh, Your Excellency Mr. Sepulveda, Judge Depez, EU Delegation India, Ambassador Manjeev Singh Puri, dear youth delegates, uh, colleagues from the European Union uh, Delegation, GIZ, uh, Michael, Rachna, Reva, uh, Center for Responsible Business, Rajit, thank you so much for being here, and our colleagues from uh, the Indian Youth Climate Network, IYCN. Uh, on behalf of the Terry family, I would like to thank you for your engagement on this uh, intergenerational as well as intragenerational uh, dialogue. We look forward to continued engagement and to staying in touch with you. And as Ambassador Puri rightly pointed, we recognize you as the norm leader. And uh, we do hope that we can continue this exchange uh, at, you know, across generations as well as across uh, different regions in India, as was rightly pointed out, you know, we are a very diverse country as well. So thank you all. Uh, there are a few refreshments at the back, back end. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, ma'am. It was an amazing session indeed. We now move on to the group photographs, one with the youth representatives and another with the organizers. And this we can with this we conclude the event. First, we will have the group photograph with the youth representatives, and I invite them. Please come. 